because mm. when we look at mm. what what mm. Uh, what uh, US is stating for the next generation air defense mm. and GAD, mm. we are we are ticking every box. Mm. What do you know about Sweden? Great forests, beautiful lakes. This, when I think to Sweden, the first thing that I think to is this. While the others are big, the Gripen is small. While the others hide themselves, the Gripen will blind you. While the others are bulky, the Gripen is slender. And while the others seem lethal, the Gripen is lethal. Today I am on a quest to understand why the Gripen is so different, and this time I'm not alone. Yeah, uh, Victor Lindman, I've been an engineer. Uh, I'm an engineer in my background and worked in Saab for 22 years now. All right, so I'm Jussi Hanotea, uh, fighter pilot by trade. So spent about 24 years in the Swedish Air Force in flying Vigens and Grippens, uh, weapons instructor, um, done operational tests and also developmental tests. Okay, I admit it. I've always been fascinated by the Grippen. The aircraft is so different from anything else that is flying out there. Saab came up with something which is a light fighter, but at the same time, something which is so much more than a simple light fighter. And when Saab offered me the possibility to learn more about the aircraft, I jumped on the opportunity. Because understanding the Gripen, understanding the solutions that have been chosen for this aircraft is not easy, but I guess we should start from the beginning, from the context in which the aircraft was born. Already in the, in the start, beginning of the 70s or 1970, mm. Two, three. There, there, we realized that we need a successor of the first of all the the Draken aircraft. So for for almost a decade, there was discussions on and off on how to do that uh, with different kinds of of uh, derivatives of the Vigen or or even new built aircraft, uh, light attacks or uh, or or not. And also we we made. Quite a, a big project with something called B3 LA, which went pretty far bef before it was abandoned. Some clever guys came up with with this this idea, and and actually, when you're talking about the definition on on the grip, and it's very very short from from the start. It's very very short because back then, in 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 the beginning of 1980, 1982, it only only said that it should be multi-role. It had to carry the same weapon load as the Wigan. But it had to be also, we believe, it should be half the weight yeah. of the Wigan uh, because we realized that weight is significant when it comes to cost. And as you know, Sweden is a very small country uh, and we, we were in anticipating an enemy in mass coming from the east. So we, these platforms, we had to buy quite a few of them and therefore the cost is, was really essential. And the last, uh, and the last of these four main tasks was also that uh, it had to fit the the dispersed uh, road based system that we have de developed on, uh, during decades to be able to take off from uh, runways uh, length four to five hundred meters and to land uh, on uh, seven to eight hundred meters. So that's kind of the leading uh, leading requirement for for that kind of uh, operations. And then of course looking at the involved threat on our doorstep in the east. Uh, so to be able to do, uh, first of all, counter air, so air policing task, it's the primary task, but then also uh, to do um, uh, anti-ship operations, anti-surface operations, as you know, it's a literal, very literal scene in uh, our surroundings. So this is interesting, there wasn't too much money, so they opted for a light aircraft because weight is correlated to cost. They also needed an aircraft that was going to fit into the Swedish system of dispersed air bases with small teams taking care of one aircraft, two aircraft, four aircraft tops. That's okay, but cannot be everything. You can't design without considering your potential opponent. And in the East, they had a massive, massive threat. I would 
would say from the 60s uh, and onwards, uh, 70s and 80s, when maybe the Cold War was as coldest and darkest uh, and most horrible as, as, as we all know. So uh, Sweden has had an um, emphasis on being independent uh, and uh, uh, only work in partnership with some, NATO, some, some allied countries without being uh, an active member of uh, organizations such as NATO. But looking at what, what the uh, environment looked like uh, in the Baltics, uh, over, the, uh, over the ocean, uh, it was very tense. Uh, it was a daily encounters uh, of aircraft, of surface vessels, of submarines. As you know, in 1982 we had this, uh, this crisis where we had a nuclear submarine uh, being grounded. So it was very eventful and very tense uh, and uh, readiness was really, really high. So that was kind of what significant, what kind of determines the period from the 70s, 80s until the beginning from the 90s. Mm. Sweden built their own uh, infrastructures, own tactical data links, uh, national. Uh, so you couldn't communicate at the time with anyone else. So everything was built uh, to purpose to defend Sweden and Sweden only. Uh, inside Sweden, outside of Sweden. So that was kind of the whole infrastructure was built, very unique uh, national devices. Uh, the Gripen is the only one that is not produced by a superpower in some, mm. well, Fra France is, mm. yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a great country. Yes, yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and also the US, uh, UK and that col collaboration with the Eurofighter and uh, with Italy. So, uh, I mean, the, the others have uh, very different resources than Sweden has when it comes to development, when, but also when it comes to the operational uh, context with how to sustain mm. this, uh, yeah. how, how to turn it, turn around on the road basis and so. So it's, uh, we, we had other prerequisites for, for how to use this system. Uh, and to be able to do that uh, because of uh, how we built our capability was to have uh, not a clear focus on, perform on, on endurance in terms of hours and flight. So uh, uh, looking at what can we do and how can we design these systems so we can maintain very high readiness. So we can have uh, very only a few minutes from our road base up into the air and then land and do very quick turnarounds and then fight again. So that was kind of uh, the first line of response. Well, this is interesting. I guess this is the proof that even a country relatively small like Sweden can do something outstanding if there is a national will to do so. For this, uh, for this project, the, the entire Sweden uh, went together. It was not just Saab creating this, but also uh, the procurement department on, within the government, the FMV, mm -hmm. and also, uh, and also the, the Air Force mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. created something called the EGAs, which is Industrial Group Gripen, uh, mm -hmm. Industrial Group JAS. Mm -hmm. We made this come through collectively, mm. in a sense. Mm. Uh, and I think that's kind of unique, but it, it, it was that oh. we had uh, a little bit the gun pointed to our heads and, and we, we needed to do this collectively. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure that it went smooth all the way because uh, people have uh, different opinions, but in the end, I think the outcome was really, really good. Um, we, we do take our chances uh, because innovation has also been, we know that, that we, are, we are small uh, and we have a big threat against us. So we have to be creative and innovative to actually stay in, in, in the lead. Uh, and that has been the case for basically all of our aircraft. Well, the first one was maybe a, more or less a copy of, of, of some Americans, but then we have evolved this. So even the, the earlier uh, aircraft, like the, the, the Flying Barrel, it was the fastest aircraft in, in the time. Mm. Uh, it, it took uh, a lot of world records. Mm. Mm. Uh, we, we made from the, uh, the, uh, the J-21 was the first one with the, with the, uh, with the serial production of the rescue system, the, the uh, uh, ejection seat. And, and so we continued also with the, with the more known innovation like the double double delta, which was introduced in the Draken. Uh, that was unknown. Okay, there you have it. You can sum up what my guests said in just one word. Asymmetry. Be different. Do something different than your opponent. 
And you can't be asymmetric without innovation. And in this case, innovation is the grip and E. Since we're talking about a lot of grip in, in, in A and B, basically, uh, what we now bring in in the grip and E, the latest version, is a totally digitalized uh, aircraft, which is another step. I will, it's a main main step. It's a, it's a, what kind of a new generation, actually. Mm. Uh, mm. Although it looks a little bit like the same, uh, we brought the best things out, out of the Group and ABs, and and uh, now it's uh, totally redesigned mm. internally. The interesting thing with that is, I'll just add quick shortly, is that because it's a new design with new avionic structure, it uh, gives you uh, possibilities to test uh, in a lab, on a rig, different, way, different ways than before. Uh, and it's interesting leading on to the airworthiness certification for the aircraft, where we believe that we have to do a lot less testing. But there are no regulations uh, with the civil aviation authorities, which still are in, in boss of the, uh, of the airspace. So we have to do a lot of testing. We think that we don't really need to, because we have to adhere to all these civil aviation regulations. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a regulation, because regulations for these types of uh, software infrastructure does not exist yet. There's another element that always puzzled me. The grip and woes design when stealth was becoming an important factor in combat aircraft design, and yet it seems a rather conventional aircraft. I'm not thinking that Saab was unaware of this trend, but there must be a reason for that. Uh, well, actually, in the in the early days on 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 the specification, uh, Gripen is actually the first Swedish aircraft that has uh, some requirements on the RCS. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, it, it, it did actually. Uh, but uh, I guess back then and and still, the cost of of, uh, of going too far in the R RCS uh, domain is very very costly. So again, I think it was more about finding alternatives. And, and back, of course, Gripen is a small aircraft also, so that it benefits from, from being small physically. Uh, but there are, of course, we've done some, some things but, but, uh, to reduce it, but, but uh, it's not been the, the main task now because we, we saw other alternatives to, the, to, uh, to that technology, most of because of costs. I would say also, uh, well, because I'm, an oper I'm a warfighter operator, so I don't really think uh, care about money, really. I just go and fly. So operationally, it's very important because of going stealth or geometric stealth, which is kind of what is attributed to stealth, the air airframe shaping and panels. That's, shape, that's stealth. But you can take another aspect of stealth because stealth is really about reducing your signature. So it's a low observable signature. And you can do that uh, different ways. You can do it by shaping your air airframe, which can be uh, labor and costly to maintain. But also if you look at how the threat and the sensors are developing and evolving, now you look at uh, uh, radars on, uh, on UHF, VHF band, you look at MIMO, LIDAR, other kind of uh, network radars and radar sensors that, uh, that, that are now fielded already. And those systems can detect stealth and we all know it. So we have yep. chosen another path where we do low observability by means of electronic warfare instead. So that has been the clear operational concept of operation idea uh, as an early start. So that's how we create LO, stealth or survivability. You can call it e stealth or whatever. It's going to be the different people call it different things. Uh, so that's just the kind of operational concept of it, the, uh, kind of besides cost and design. Well, uh, yes, the Gripen Electronic Suite, the one that made the British Typhoon pilots say that the Gripen could get scarily close before being detected. Well, there's hardware and there's software, and there's uh, all kind of different uh, apertures, as you know. Uh, so, we, and they, they keep evolving all the time. So, with Gripen E now, uh, well, I'll start with saying what electronic warfare is in the warfighting arena for, of military fighter platforms. So, it's going to be defined by electronic protection, electronic attack, and electronic support measures. So, now with Gripen E from earlier versions A, B, and C, D, it's a whole new capability which we're introducing in terms of uh, what we can do, uh, what wavelength we use, uh, what different jamming techniques we are using, and then how we are integrating that into the tactical air unit through tactical data links, how we can work collectively. Uh, active passive sensing, um, focused threats, uh, and so on, so on. So that's kind of the concept 
that we look have been looking at and we are evolving constantly. I think that's probably really deep, uh, deep as, as I can go in the kind of looking at and de describing it. Uh, technical. Yeah, but, but also that is connected yeah. to the seamlessly now into the new avi mm. uh, uh, yeah. avionic system that we have. Yeah. So and and being able to upgrade these things as uh, as the war develops mm. rather than than on on a MLU at some point. Uh, so we can we can mm. be very very flexible when it comes new mm. new you 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 see now new threats and how. You want to change the system. Mm. It can be done in days, and it's beyond uh, a technical uh, library for uh, which everyone can do. You can update your electronic warfare library or ESM library or whatever. Now you can actually, when there is a crisis, when you start seeing the real wartime, real emitter data out there uh, of your opposition, you can then use that information and tweak your tactical system, such as radar, such as weapon systems, such as communication. And you're in control. You don't have to send it overseas to a big nation in the West and wait for three months and get a, a large bill to that. You can do it within days, within weeks, at squadron level within your own country, yeah. independently. Mm. We, we, without mm. uh, disturbing the integrity of, of the, the yeah. vital mm. things, things in the system. Yes. So, th so that, mm. that is that is unique. Yes. No one has done it before. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's been talked about now. Actually, the, over the summer I saw NGAD, US NGAD. You know, sixth yeah. gen. They are now launching uh, a separated uh, software infrastructure. And we already have it now. Yeah. Uh, we've had it for many, many years already. We worked on. Mm. We have worked on that for ten years now. And, uh, yeah. and and we we can see the fruit we can see the fruits of it. Yes. Even old style gentlemen like myself should accept it. The way of air war is changing. Uh, uh, we, I'm going to start to sound like a marketeer here, but uh, <laughs> I'm not. A warfighter perspective. We've taken the best electronic warfare system which we could find and we can build, and then we put grip around it. That's that's the basics because we need it in terms to create uh, survivability because of the environment which we live in, which uh, long-range uh, advanced ground-based air defense systems uh, uh, around our doorstep. And also uh, situation awareness, so uh, lethality, to uh, pick up having a very good sensor, sensor suite, active passive sensing, uh, electronic support measures. So we've, we use uh, a IS active uh, uh, electron e-scan radar arrays, apertures, in the nose, but also around uh, six other uh, places in the airframe to, to produce that. And uh, the IESA technology gives you uh, obviously a unique flexibility in working everywhere around the field of regard within fractions of seconds. So for me as a pilot, that gives true omni role capability. So you can support weapons in the air domain or well, in the air to air fight simultaneously as you can support weapons and work uh, on air to ground targets or air to surface targets. So true, multi true omni role, not a swing role anymore. It can do everything simultaneously. Also, we put emphasis on field of regard, so flexibility of using the sensor. So we put the ISR uh, radar on a swash plate and you can steer it around and actually uh, find and uh, locate and track targets and missiles uh, over the shoulder when you are moving away from the target. So that's kind of the concept of uh, how we produce this to be able to do that superior tactics I was talking about earlier. There is one uh, one fighter platform in the world that does it like that, and that's uh, the Gripen E. No one else is doing that yet. Mm. But I, I guess they will copy us on that. So. Maybe, yeah. Mm. And, and mm. yeah, it, that we are fighting above our weight, yeah, I, I think so, mm. too, we are. Mm. Um, I think why we can do that is that we have embra always embraced mm technology and innovation. Uh, we have had a very close uh, cooperation with, with our government uh, and also the, the end user, uh, putting the, the, the real requirements mm. onto us. Mm -hmm. so, so we have embraced that the, mm. the technology. We have a close connection with, with pilots like you see here, to, to when in the development we, we have a great HMI, uh, to really make it uh, visible to the pilot where they are, why they are there, and, and what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we used to call it HMI, now it's HMC, which is human-machine collaboration rather than, than the integration. 
uh, it's collaboration because mm. because uh, the grip and E is a, uh, you're flying with your wingman all the time. Mm. So Look, the uh, the air warfare is changing now uh, because of what happens in uh, in the threat in the, in in the, in the evolution of uh, uh, technology and tactics that come along with it. So looking at third fourth generation uh, F16 grip and C uh, F18 types of typhoon even Rafale types of platforms you fight in a different way now because now everything is interconnected. Uh, you have new sensors that can do new things. You fly in a tactical air unit comprising of four, six, eight aircraft, and one pilot is no longer in charge of his own sensors. Everyone in the whole fight uses everyone else's sensors. So you can't just go there and put your radar on and off because then you will destroy the whole tactical idea. So this is, uh, uh, I can talk about hours, but I'll just say that everything is now changing and you need to be able to uh, integrate your systems. You need to be able to network uh, to be able to fight the fight uh, in the most proper way. Otherwise, you'll lose. We had an entire series about the F-35 software, but I believe that the Gripen is not much different. The short version is that we have uh, split the, the software into two parts. One that is uh, uh, flat cricket critical, which we're not supposed to, to touch that much. And then also we have this tactical avionics or mm. tactical uh, system. And those are separated now. So we can, we can, we can mess, our, mess around with the tactical side without uh, messing with the integrity of the flight crit critical part. The airworthiness is based, based on the air critical path. So, so when, when we are develop, developing a new software, we don't have to go into this uh, certification mm -hmm. uh, procedure again. Therefore, we keep it only in the tactical uh, system and mm -hmm. then uh, it's not a big deal. <laughs> So no, uh, no uh, retrospective uh, test and evaluation to find out that you didn't mess something else up. Yeah. And also you can take the, the uh, mission part of that mission computer and do much of the testing in your rigs and in your labs already to see that it will actually work. Uh, which means that also that then mandates you to do much less uh, uh, validation and verification on what changes you have made. Uh, the other bit is here that mo much of this thing you can do Maybe not on the squadron level on an airbase uh, under a tree in the snow, but not not far from it. So you can do much of that uh, as a as a war fighting air force uh, within your own organization. Uh, so you have the independence and the power to change things as you like. Um, um, what, was that uh, clear enough? Or? Hmm? I suppose that I will get comments saying, no, we want the details, how many processes are running, which are the processor, which are the computers, how, ma how much memory do we have? <laughs> but that's... In our, in our uh, six or seven or eight test aircraft yeah. we have here, they change processors, uh, not every week, but not far from it. Yeah. So we, we can change processors in the computers. That's also... Very stuff. quickly, very, very swiftly, without messing yeah. the pro test program up. That, that's also yeah. something yeah. that has been connect yeah. disconnected. Yes. Why we are the, this uh, dig, totally digitalized uh, development? Mm -hmm. We can we can change the the software on board in days. We can we can uh, remove or and replace the computers with new computers mm -hmm. in a week, and we can do all kinds of uh, upgrades mm -hmm. with uh, in in a very very short time, mm -hmm. and uh, that's one of the essence because Gripen is seen uh, as a low cost. But it doesn't mean that it's low quality. Although when you go on onto the supermarket and buy a cheap wrench, that you so you're, you you anticipate that it will break in, in if you use it two times or something. But, and and that's a little bit of our dilemma because people think just because it's low cost, it's low quality. But but it's quite the opposite, I would say. It's low cost because we use the next generation technology on board. Uh, so changes. Uh, isn't that easy uh, that hard to do and mm. it, if it's not hard to do it doesn't cost you that much mm. so uh, so we, we we find that we have found a, a, a way of breaking the cost curve the, the Augustine's law mm. you, you know where uh, the aircraft just get more and more and more expensive and I think in is it uh, 2050 they say that US Air Force can buy one unit uh, <laughs> mm. If, if it continues, we have broken that because we, we are using 
in new innovative technology to, to do that, to, to keep the pace on technology but reduce the cost. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is misunderstood in, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, in, in general. It gives you flexibility and it gives you that resilience and robustness you're looking at. As, as your Air Force commander wants to have his or her jets in, in airborne, right? That's uh, what you get by, by kind of that fit in, applying that philosophy yeah. where you have the power. But When we look at what, what, mm -hmm. uh, what the US is stating for the next generation air defense and guard, mm -hmm. we, are, we are ticking every box. Mm -hmm. uh, Except maybe the, the, maybe the range and endurance. Yeah, maybe range and endurance, but, but mm -hmm. when, it, when it comes to development new, new systems and, mm -hmm. and the pace to do it, mm -hmm. uh, we are already there. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe we don't, don't touch the stealth. Well, we do it our, our way, yeah. the, the stealth mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. thing. So, Victor, and you see work for Saab, and obviously they uh, put Saab products in the best light possible, but I am 100% sure that they are intellectually honest and that they do believe what they told us in this interview. From my point of view, I have been confirming what I was thinking even before, that is, the Gripen is definitely one of the most interesting concepts of our day and age. It is different. It has so many interesting solutions and um, yeah probably came along at the wrong time against the wrong aircraft anyway thank you very much to Saab for giving me the opportunity to interview our friends if this interview inspired you to learn more about the grip and there are plenty of videos on the channel and these videos are going to appear beside me if you click on them it's a good way to support the channel so Thank you very, very much for watching. See you next time.